All right. Good evening, everybody. It is 7.30 and it's time to get started with the last meeting of 2023 for the Wisconsin chapter of the National Railway Historical Society. I'm your past president, Mike Uhas. So delighted that you're here either in person uh, or um, through the miracle of modern technology and, and Zoom. So, um, so just a couple of announcements. Uh, it's our last meeting of uh, 2023. Thank you all for being here. Um, if you are a member of the Wisconsin chapter NRHS and have not yet renewed your membership for 2024, Tara Grudzlanek, our treasurer is in the room here tonight. You can hand her $20 or, um, or you could do so, uh, you can renew online at our website, which is www.nrhswis.org. And there it will be $21 uh, for your membership. Uh, and if you are not yet a member, please do join us uh, because it's the members of our, our group that, uh, that make these meetings happen, uh, thanks to their support. So we want to count on your support as well. So please become a member if you're not one yet. Thank you. So next month, um, 5th of January, Jim Rint of Sheboygan. I, I consider Jim Rint one of the, well, perhaps the preeminent historian of railways in Sheboygan County. Uh, and I mean that with all sincerity, Jim. Uh, he has an amazing collection of resources. He's going to share a bunch of them with you. Um, and that'll be next next week, next month, January 5th, uh, specifically looking at streetcars and interurbans of Sheboygan County, uh, uh, stuff that, that happened in town and on out west to Elkhart Lake. So that's uh, going to be a worthwhile program. And then the following um, meeting will be in February. Uh, we don't have the program quite lined up yet, but we have some great ideas. Uh, and one important thing is uh, it's our chapter's annual business meeting, which we strive to get through with very, very quickly. So it's not a burden to anybody. Uh, we're going to have election of chapter officers. Um, I was just informed that uh, the person who is sitting to my right, Mr. Keith Schmidt, um, will actually put his name in the hat to run as president. Keith, Keith just said we need a vice president. We will need a vice president. So there you go. So we're going to get started. Our um, program tonight is a, a, a retrospective, a look back at the photography of Lynn Westcott. And our our presenter is Kevin Keefe, a former editor of Trains Magazine, former vice president of editorial for, for Trains Magazine, uh, member of our chapter, member of NRHS, he's a uh, and an all-around good guy. Yeah, Allison, I'm saying that, and uh, uh, I consider him a, a a a true friend and a friend of myself personally and a friend of the chapter. But in the early 1970s, at his first iteration as an employee of Kalmbach Publishing, Kevin worked in the promotions department. He'll tell you about all the wonderful copy that he wrote back in the day, because uh, there were some classics there, and uh, they were never that like that since then. I can tell you that. But uh, but he actually got to 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 work with to a small extent with with Lynn Westcott back in the day. So um, so you know we're we're working from ground zero here. So I, I would like to welcome my good friend uh, Kevin Keefe to the Wisconsin chapter NRHS. Well, it's great to be here, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'll get to the photographs in a minute. Um, as I was driving up here tonight, I got a little bittersweet or a little nostalgic. Uh, Allison and I came up here a while ago, and as I pulled into the parking lot, I remembered back to when I joined this chapter the first time back in 1974, when I was 23 years old and uh, thrilled to be working at Kambach. It was like, uh, and I, it was a big deal. <laughs> And uh, coming to these meetings in those days was really fun because I was with a bunch of people that I had known about before I even got here, people that were really big names for me. I, and 
Harold Edmondson was a regular attendee, and of course, JDI, Dave Ingalls, Schaefer, Mike Schaefer, and George Drury would likely be here. So, uh, uh, and then I remember one of the first times I was here too, I remember it was so cool that as we were filing in for the meeting, a, a northbound Northwestern train went roaring through, probably a through train headed all the way to Green Bay back in those days. So that was kind of neat. So I'm here to talk about uh, the photography of Lynn Westcott. I won't be talking too much about where he made his biggest reputation was that as one of the great gurus of the model railroad hobby. I'm not a modeler myself, but uh, but I did know Lynn briefly, and I'll talk about uh, that a little bit as we go along. I, I'm starting out, well, let me mention one other thing too. This presentation was originally put together for the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. I'm a member of the board of directors, and so in some ways, I'd like to th I'd like you to think of this as a presentation brought to you by the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. I did this online back in uh, July. And if you've seen it before that earlier time, I, I hope you enjoy it a second time around. And I'll just mention one other thing. Here's a great photograph that I never knew existed until I did this program of a very young Lynn Westcott in 1937 on a Pennsylvania railroad train uh, passing what I believe is Kittening Point. Um, station on Horseshoe Curve. This was back when he was just a 25-year-old or whatever age he was, associate editor working for Al Kambach at the very beginning of the company. Lynn was born in July 1913 in Los Angeles. Uh, he ended up attending Carleton College in Minnesota, which helps explain why he ended up working at Kambach. He, I think he made a connection somehow to Al Kambach when he was in college. He was one of the company's very first employees starting in 1935, and in those days worked as an early all-purpose editor, both on the train staff and on MR. He, the company was very small in those days and had no money, and so everybody was kind of uh, multi-purpose. But that was good because Lynn could do all kinds of stuff. He was a really, he was a good editor and writer, but he was also a skilled map maker and page designer. So those skills came in handy beyond the usual ones. Uh, of course, he made his real fame in between 61 and 77, when for 16 years he was the editor-in-chief of MR and became uh, quite famous in the model railroad, both hobby and industry, as one of the hobby's great innovators. And he offered several best-selling model railroad books, many of which are still in the Kambach catalog. And he died a relatively young, uh, yeah, I'm not doing the math here, so I, 67, is that what somebody said? Yeah. In 1980 in Milwaukee, but uh, but I knew Lynn a little bit because I worked in the sales department. One of the one thing I want to mention right off is many of you will recognize this famous photograph that was on the cover of the first issue of Trains in November 1940, and uh, I, I chose to start the program with this because this was a Lynn Westcott photograph, and I believe that uh, Lynn had a role in choosing it for the cover, although Al Kambach was actually the editor in 1940 for the first issue. And there was this great quote I ran across that Dave Morgan wrote about Lynn later. What a bio cannot tell you is how Lynn, Lynn led Trains Magazine down paths never trod by a railroad magazine before. <clears throat> For instance, the first cover of Trains. One would expect the obvious, a train, of course. But the obvious and Lynn were incompatible. Instead, volume one, number one's cover was a photo of a wooden water tank shot by Lynn at an angle 15 degrees off center. Alas, we never asked him why a tank made the cover instead of a train or a locomotive, but we're sure his answer would have been that in the steam season, water was as key an element as rolling stock and deserved the honor. I thought that was a great uh, tribute that Morgan wrote. And uh, before I move on to the slide, does anybody know where this water tank was? Bingo. Yep. Yep. This was up in northeastern Wisconsin. When I first started reading trains and saw pictures of this first cover, I always assumed it was on the Denver Rio Grande Western, but not so. Here's, here's examples of some of the best sellers that Lynn wrote. Well, of course, on the far left is, a, is an example of memoir during the era when he was editor. But here are three other books that he was the editor of or wrote. And um, I know that uh, 101 track plans and HO Railroad that grows, well, the other one too, this the steam locomotive psych, they've been in the Kambach catalog one way or the, or the other for 50 or 60 years. I wouldn't be surprised if HO Railroad that grows has sold 100,000 copies over the last half century, which 
probably doesn't mean much to a New York publisher, but that is a big selling book in, in, the, in a hobby like model railroading. Here's a picture of Lynn early in his career at his desk. Uh, I believe this was taken at 1027 North 7th Street. This would be post-1942. The company moved to that location that we are all quite familiar with in 1942 after having been at some earlier locations in Wauwatosa and down on Pierce Street on the near south side. But as you can see here from this photograph, um, Lynn was not just an editor. Here he is at a drafting table, probably working on a track plan or a map for one of the magazines. Here he is years later. This is a photograph taken in the 70s of Lynn fine-tuning the running gear mechanism of an HO scale steam locomotive in a customary pose taken in the, what was the uh, model railroad or workroom back in those days downtown. Another shot of Lynn exhibiting his tried and true method for building scenery. But this is what we're all about tonight. These pictures were, uh, well, they weren't discovered after his passing in 1980. He certainly knew about them and so did his wife, but uh, the rest of us didn't, uh, I'm told. And what we found was a treasure trove of old Kodachromes that his widow brought into Kambach at one point and said, look at this is stuff that I think you guys should have. And of course, I wasn't there at that mo point, but I'm sure a lot of people flipped out when they went through and saw what Lynn had done. This was the product of years and years of Lynn being on the road for Kambach and taking rail fan pictures. He, they, were, they weren't taking for any purpose as near as I can tell. They were simply him enjoying himself out on the road and getting what he could get. And his pictures made quite a splash after they were discovered. Uh, rather quickly, uh, Dave Morgan made sure there was a cover story about Lynn's photographs in the March 85 issue of Trains called The Color World of Lynn Westcott, which is if you can, if you have a back issue, or if you are have a membership that gets you access to the digital archive of trains, you should check it out. Also, one of his really wonderful photographs was uh, in, in many of the many printings of the diesel locomotives, the first 50 years, a, a great book that Kambach had in the catalog for many, many years. I'm told, unfortunately, that no one can find the original slide. Uh, that's why I simply, I was going to include the photograph in the program, but all I could really get was a, a photograph of the uh, book cover. So here's some photographs demonstrating just how much Lynn loved one-to-one -one scale. Here's a shot that we ended up putting on a calendar and including, and also included in a train's special edition, the 100 Greatest Railroad Photos of All Time, uh, back about 20 years ago. This is a shot of a Santa Fe E6 getting the highball, departing west from Kansas City Union Station in the late 1940s. And uh, I, there's a lot of things to like about this picture. It's slightly panned. So you see a little bit of motion in it, but also the, uh, the the jaunty pose of the hogger as he's looking back over the consist as he pulls away from the platform. Here, Lynn caught a Northern Pacific 484 leading a westbound on the high bridge at uh, Valley City, North Dakota. And uh, I've never witnessed this bridge before, but it's still there. And what a wonderful photograph of steam in all its glory, including those wonderful Northerns, uh, the railroad that bequeathed the name Northern to the 484. Another Northern Pacific shot. I don't know where this is. One of the, one of the occupational hazards of dealing with Lynn Westcott's photography is the slide mounts have almost no information on them. So as, as a lot of us have gone through them over the years for various purposes, we've had a heck of a time in many cases figuring out and in a lot of cases not figuring out where these pictures were taken. I don't know where this was. I sure would love to know because that's such a distinctive uh, water tank behind those um, F units and also what looks to be the hint of uh, an engine house or maybe a roundhouse. Just don't know where that is. But what a wonderful, the engines are, this is probably late 40s, early 50s. The engines are pretty darn new and the paint scheme's in perfect condition. And it's got that wonderful slogan, Main Street in the Midwest along the flank or Northwest, excuse me, Main Street in the Northwest. This really caught my eye and just shows you uh, how crazy things could get on the good old Rock Island. This is a photograph near Houston, Texas. 
in the uh, early 50s showing at least three different well showing three different paint schemes on the rock island um uh, the f7 leads with the uh, orange stripe and then the middle f f7b has got a different paint scheme and then one of the latter day i believe i'm not sure what the dates were on these schemes uh, adorns this alco fa not to mention that very cool eerie box car with no graffiti on it Here's a shot that we have published at one point or other. This is a great shot in Tehachapi Pass, a quartet of, uh, yeah, a quartet of F3s approaching Tehachapi, California with a steam helper on the rear. If you look to the rear of the train around the S-curve, there's the unmistakable uh, evidence of the column of steam coming from the helper on the rear end. And we'll see that helper in a moment. It's not a very long train, as you can see, but up in those mountains, uh, you still needed a helper. And here he comes with a helper with an SP cab forward on the back pushing as he uh, climbs into Tehachapi. Back in 40 foot boxcar days. Near the same place, quite possibly the town of Tehachapi, here we show an engine change, steam and diesel. There's a steam engine behind the four F units. This may be actually involving the train we just saw a picture with before, but you have to sort of deduce that because again, Lynn said really nothing about these pictures on the slide mount. Uh, I think they're probably taken the same day. And I sent this photograph to John Signer, who is you know, probably the world's leading expert on the SP. And he, he, even he wasn't entirely sure where this was taken, but his best guess was to Hatchapi. Now we jump to a completely different place. We're in Dillonvale, Ohio. And here's a grab shot that Lynn got of a nickel plate former Wheeling and Lake Erie 284 Berkshire number 825 at the Pine Valley engine terminal. And uh, when the nickel plate took over the Wheeling, these engines kept their 800 numbers, but as you can see, they were re-lettered <clears throat> in the style of the nickel plate. And these engines remained down in Southeast Ohio in old Wheeling territory for quite a while because of all the coal business that was coming up from Southeast Ohio and heading up to Lake Erie where it would be loaded onto to uh, ore boats. I'm a New York Central fan, so I love this next pair of photographs. Uh, 1953, things have not started to go downhill yet on the New York Central, so here we have train 51 the Empire Express behind absolutely clean E8s and an absolutely shiny stainless steel consist, all matching, roaring through Rochester, New York. And here is the rear end of the train, beautiful, with one of those bud teardrop <clears throat> observation cars on the end. And you can't read it, but I'm pretty sure the tail sign does indeed say Empire State Express. Lynn jumps all over the place, so you never know where we're going to end up next. Here we are somewhere in Tennessee, and I'm sorry I can't tell you where, because once again, there was nothing on the slide mount. But we do know it's an LNN 282 leading a freight, and I'm guessing from the sun angle and everything else, that it's heading toward Nashville, uh, heading up an extra, as the white flags say. But it's a classic view of uh, LNN steam, which uh, was a elegant looking engines where they always put the engine number up on the headlight glass. We head west again now that we're back in, uh, in well now we're in Kansas City again, on Kansas City terminal trackage, as an E5 leads the Kansas City Zephyr through town. I got out a Kansas City Google satellite map up on my screen and tried like crazy to figure out just exactly where this was. And I, for the life of me, I couldn't, so I don't know. And throughout this presentation, if anybody ever recognizes anything specific that I'm not saying, please shout out. But it's a great shot with a delivery truck. It appears to be a delivery truck on the street next to the train. Now we're up in Evansville, Minnesota. At first, I thought this was a Sioux line picture, 
it, again, there was nothing written on it. Somehow I found out later it was a Great Northern train. For a minute there, I imagined this was north of Duplainville <laughs> along the Sioux somewhere, because it, doesn't it kind of look like that? And, and of course, the Sioux line had that slightly raised headlight, which was never a, a, a style I particularly liked. But I, I eventually was determined, I think I might have found out that this was published somewhere, and somebody at trains way back determined that this was near Evansville. And it's a meet. Uh, you can see that uh, th there's a going away freight there with a caboose on the left side of the picture. And one of the crew members is on the ground talking to the engine crew on the uh, on the steam engine, which is probably a 282. Down in Nashville again. Now we're in West Nashville at the West Nashville shops of the NC and St. L, the Nashville, Chattanooga, and St. Louis. When they're Beautiful F7 diesels were pretty darn new. And I, I don't know what's going on here. It could be that this was the delivery of these units, because if you look to the right center of the photograph, there's not just <clears throat> engine crew and hostlers hanging around, but there's definitely some guys in fedoras and uh, sport coats, which tells me there was some management on the property that day for some reason. Another shot of uh, one of their new F7s at West Nashville with the Hostler, I think, filling the water tank. But he may be filling the oil tank. I'm not sure what he's doing. Again at West Nashville, he also got this photograph of NC and St. L's one EMW SW1. They had one, and this is it, along with a Jeep behind it, surrounded by some other F units. Great paint schemes back in those days. Very famous place on the Southern Railway. We're at Saluda, North Carolina in the early 50s as Southern Railway F units lug a passenger train up the long grade from the bottom at Saluda. And I don't, I didn't record the, exactly what the grade is, but I believe it's 4.7% is the ruling grade on Saluda Hill. Steepest mainline grade, it is said, in the United States. And I wish I could tell you what the name of the train is, because it does have a name, but he didn't he didn't write it down. And boy, don't you love that SO gas station over to the left? And now we're going to go to the bottom of Saluda Hill, and you can see what it takes to keep a train from running away. Uh, brake shoes and Retainers smoking from the descent, S uh, Southern Railway F units reach the bottom of the grade. And you can just see, you don't need much convincing to see how dangerous that hill could be if, if it isn't in the right hands of the right crew. Lynn took a lot of pictures at one point along US 30 in Nebraska, some of which ended up on the cover of a couple of Kambach publications. Here's another shot I don't think we ever did use of a UP-2102 running across uh, the Union Pacific in full flight, taking reefers across Nebraska. You see the cattle guard there by the grade crossing. Classic UP power, older UP power with a Vanderbilt tender. And probably the same day, uh, I'd love to be able to tell you what kind of car Lynn or his companion is driving, but he shot over the hood of their car as they chased uh, on the left a giant 4122 heading east and another 4122 meeting it along US 30. And I believe only one of these is saved. And I believe it's at the museum in Pomona, California. I love this picture uh, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, first, obviously, is the, is the daylight, uh, the coast daylight, which is often called the most beautiful train in the world. The railroad gave it that name, but a lot of people would agree. But I love the fact that Lynn was obviously chasing that day with somebody, probably somebody from Kambach. And I'm almost willing to bet that the guy on the roof of the car is Bill Aiken. Just the just the the cut of his jib, if you will, reminds me of Bill. And Bill was with Lynn in those early days at Kambach. He was also my first boss at Kambach in 1974. He was vice president of sales. But Bill, before that, was the art director for trains. And during the war, uh, I always like to mention this, he was a B-25 captain in Italy. 
So I'm not sure that's Bill, but it's somebody standing up there getting a great photograph. And you might notice the bumper sticker for a train, a model train show nearby, near Santa Margarita, California. Another SP shot. Love this shot. This is uh, through the rocks near Chatsworth, California, on the coastline. F units are leading a Southern Pacific freight northward. That would be Railroad West on the coastline at Chatsworth. Cattle car indeed. And of course, that fabulous Black Widow paint scheme. Now a, a set of pictures that um, Lynn seemed to have a real attachment to the Monon Railroad. There's a lot of pictures by him on the Monon in the library. I didn't use all that many, but um, Here's a great shot taken at the little town of Monticello, Indiana in December, 1950. And Monticello was on the old Monon um, branch to Indianapolis. So this was train 11, Chicago to Indianapolis, arriving on a December morning in 1950. So much to look at here. The baggage carts, the arriving train, two F units and only five cars. <clears throat> I, I can't tell you what kind of car that is on the right, the automobile, but it sure looks cool. And, uh, and the train order signal. So a really wonderful kind of pastiche of small town America back in the railway age. Here's the activity on that platform at Monticello as the train paused and uh, station agent and baggage hands made sure that everything got exchanged uh, effectively. You can see uh, the red and white paint scheme that was inspired by Indiana University. On the, uh, on the express car and on the baggage car behind it. And getting ready for departure, the uh, two F3s are plenty of power for the train 11's five cars. And of course, this piece of railroad is long gone. Way up in British Columbia now, near Lilliut, we're watching GE 70 tonners haul a Pacific Great Eastern train along Seton Lake. Uh, this was a fairly substantial railroad, but it would always amaze me that they relied for so much of their work on 70 tonners. I'm wondering if maybe this is an excursion train of some kind. Uh, those are very old cars on the right, and a lot of people seem to be enjoying th the view through the open window, but maybe it's a regular train but the scenery is pretty incomparable. Here's a spot that I checked today just to make sure I knew where it was because I hadn't heard of it before, even though I was raised in Michigan. Here's a Grand Trunk 484 leading an eastbound freight at Capac, Capac, Michigan. And this is hmm, about halfway between Flint and Port Huron on the main line into Canada. So this 484 is headed for Port Huron where the train will be handed off to the CN to go further into Canada. And these 484s, of course, were near carbon copies of the same class of engines on Canadian National, which owned Grand Trunk Western. <clears throat> and while he was there, Lynn got this nice portrait of the front of the engine, 6326, which does not survive, but two sisters do, uh, 6323 down at Union and 6325 in the Roundhouse at Sugar Creek, Ohio, at the Age of Steam Roundhouse. And of course, the 6325 ran for a few years after the year 2000 down on the Ohio Central Railroad. Another shot back on the upper, upper Midwest, uh, if not the Northwest, here's a crew on a great northern caboose hop, enjoying the breeze at Fergus Falls, Minnesota. And I tried like the devil to ascertain the wheel arrangement. I can't really tell, but I'm pretty sure it's a 282 and uh, with an extra water tank behind the main tender. And wh what a beautiful caboose. I mean, it's it's clean as a whistle. It's got Rocky the Goat on the back and on the side, and it's got the classification lights. That, that, that was railroading, not to mention that wonderful train order signal on the platform. And look at that immaculate wooden platform. One thing you'll notice about Lynn Westcott's pictures, he tried to include so much of the texture of the railroad environment. Here he's still on the GN, and I don't know much about this quarry, but I pretty much figured out that this was 
at Fort Wright, which is just west of Spokane. So that makes this an eastbound Great Northern passenger train taken around 1950, 51. I'd love to know what, I'd love to be able to tell you what train, or, what train it is. It's not the builder, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a worthy train, obviously. But Lynn didn't write it down, so <laughs> I just don't know. Again, this shows Lynn's love of physical plant, which is what you'd expect, right, Keith, from a model railroader. <laughs> so Lynn also had a deep attraction to traction, if you will. And so we're going to have some traction pictures here, much of which, some of which include our beloved hometown of Milwaukee. Uh, this is around 1937. Here we've got a pair of TM cars approaching West Junction, which is unrecognizable almost completely these days. You can sort of tell what all this is if you go out there today, if you kind of know what you're looking at. But this, of course, is where the railroad split, uh, the, the, the interurban split between its line uh, south to Hales Corners and beyond, or to the west to Waukesha. And it also intercepted the Chicago and Northwestern here, two of the Northwestern's lines, which will come up later in the presentation, its main line through Butler, but also its branch to Waukesha and Wales and on to Madison. So West Junction was one of the more complex interurban junctions you'll ever run into, and that's why Lynn liked it. Here's another shot, even earlier than that, I believe. That's a really old car. I don't know what year this was. I, I'm, I'm guessing it's 1935. I don't think it'd be taken before that because I don't think Lynn lived around here then. But again, it's at West Junction, and I, and I love the uh, destination sign displaying public service building. Uh, which, of course, we all know still stands beautifully so, downtown Milwaukee on Michigan. And you can see how the interurban in the distance was vaulting up and over the northwestern line to Waukesha. Here's a shot at the intersection of Plankinton and Wisconsin, taken approximately 1938, showing a lot of those, a couple of those classic Milwaukee streetcars. And of course, an unbelievably busy amount of pedestrian traffic and other automobiles. This is a very complex junction. And I'm guessing he took this from the Gimbel's parking structure get based on the shadows. I think he's at the southwest corner of the corner, which makes the Gimbel's buildings up at the top of the picture. And then over on the right, out of sight, would be the old, old, long gone Milwaukee Sentinel building. And then on the left would be the corner just down a, a, a one address from the Plankinton Arcade. Purely a guess, but I think I think that's what we see here. Again, if anybody wants to straighten me out, I'd love to hear it. Here's late in the game for the Interurban. This is uh, in, taken in 1951, a speed rail car heading west on the rapid transit line beneath the high tension towers just west of 35th Street. And that open property off to the left, kind of in the semi-distance, is where they would build County Stadium. And of course, I would guess within weeks, or maybe not only days after he took this, the speed rail line was abandoned. And then maybe why he took the photograph. I believe that's an old Cincinnati lightweight car that speed rail bought to try and, you know, keep themselves the head above water. I love this photograph. North Shore Silver Liner is transitioning from 6th to 5th Streets on Milwaukee's south side. I didn't, I forgot to write down for tonight the Catholic Church in the distance, <clears throat> but it's still there. It's a beautiful building and it helped me identify exactly where this was. Of course, you can drive on this little section of the Northwestern now. I think this is where you jog over from 6th to 5th to head south on 5th Street next to the freeway. Now we're in Pittsburgh, and um, we're right near the glorious Pittsburgh and Lake Erie passenger de depot, what was called the trolley tunnel. You see uh, PCC cars coming over from downtown Pittsburgh, crossing the, uh, I'm guessing it's the Allegheny River. I'm not sure which, which river that is. And then on the left, you see some of the building of the PNLE depot, which survives today as a uh, wonderful shopping emporium and hotel. Another overhead street traction view. This is in uh, Santa Ana, California on 4th Street. 
and he photographed from some building a Pacific Electric blimp in an urban car. Lots of wonderful street scenery here. A little north of there, we're near Sacramento. Actually, we're near Oakland. This is a Sacramento Northern Freight behind one of their freight motors working its way east of Oakland through Shepherd Canyon. And as I understand it now, <clears throat> everything you see in this photograph is covered by suburban housing now. But this is what it looked like around 1950 when the Sacramento Northern was still operating a fairly rural railroad between uh, Sacramento and, uh, and Oakland. Here's an even better picture in my book. Same train, Sacramento Northern 661, one of two Class D 1,000 house horsepower steeple cabs delivered in 1927 and retired from service by 1954. So obviously the photograph was taken uh, before 1954. I love this picture because I love New Orleans and I've ridden the streetcar on a number of occasions. Here we see an elegant white gloved pedestrian. She's walking uh, along St. Charles Avenue in New Orleans, New Orleans, <clears throat> and she's being approached from behind by one of their great old streetcars. I'm guessing the date is 1962-ish, judging by the T-Bird and now maybe even by that um, Chevy Belvedere or Biscayne uh, right behind it. I'm thinking 62-ish. And I went on Google Street View and found out where this was. So those buildings, those wonderful 19th century buildings you see in the distance, the four of them all kind of smashed up together, they're still there. But look at the businesses you can see, a sport amusement center, a Southern Blueprint. Uh, there's a liquor store over on the opposite corner. Great shot. Here's three photographs of a railroad I don't know much about, but I'm determined to learn more about, and that is the South's great heavy-duty interurban, the P Piedmont and Northern. And if you didn't know it was a P the heavy-duty kind of interurban, you would after seeing these gigantic 118-ton motors they use, these four late-model four-truck Piedmont and Northern motors. I sent this photograph to a guy, a friend of mine, who runs a short line railroad now that operates on much of the old Piedmont Northern track. And for the life of him and for me and love for the life of me, he couldn't identify where this was. I wish we could tell because the church is, the church is pretty darned identifiable, but I don't know where it is, but it's down somewhere near Anderson, South Carolina. I do know where this is. Here's a Piedmont Northern freight winding its way through Gastonia, North Carolina, now a Western suburb of Charlotte. Footnote, the late trains editor, Jim Ridd, my good buddy, started his journalism career after he graduated from North Carolina. He started out as a reporter on the Gastonia Gazette. And imagine how cool it would be to live in Gastonia and have trains like this rolling through town. And finally, another Piedmont Northern shot, one of their big motors at the Duke Power Riverbend Power Plant. And I believe there's still a major power station there. I don't think it's coal powered anymore, but I'm not sure at Mount Holly, North Carolina. But a lot of interesting stuff to see here. Again, the sort of stuff that would really turn on a modeler, the motor, the catenary, the trackage, but also that, uh, that fabulous old rotary dumper that's uh, unloading the hopper cars. Another traction shot, this this one kind of surprised me, but obviously Lynn was doing some kind of business in Washington, D.C. This is late, late, late in the game for Washington streetcars because, well, you can see the bus on the right, the invader is already in his photograph. I believe they only had one of these. This was a PCC car uh, converted to be called the Silver Sightseer. So this was a, a car intended to be chartered or used by tourists just to look at the sights of Washington, D.C. around town. I love the rakish pennant flag flying from up near the, uh, the main door. And as some of you know, uh, in parts of, uh, including right here, in parts of Washington, the trolleys got their power from a... Um, a, well, kind of a suspended power cable in between the rails. 
this is trolley poles are all down here. So this must have been in underground power territory. Physical plant, a modeler's domain. This is where uh, Lynn was also in his element, was depicting what the railroad plant looked like. Excuse me. Here he is back at West Junction, but this time a photograph that's uh, not all messed up by one of those pesky trains. Uh, we're looking south to where the Milwaukee Electric crossed over the Chicago Northwestern Main Line to Butler, taken about 1938. And that line that goes up and over the bridge heads south to Hales Corners, Burlington, uh, St. Uh, what is it? In Franklin. St. Martin's. Yeah, thank you. And points south. Lots to see here, the big switch stand lamp, the relatively sophisticated track work and, and relatively heavy duty, speaking of that, for an interurban. Love this picture. Uh, he didn't say what it was, but I'm pretty darn sure this was the Milwaukee Electric's rapid transit through Truss Bridge, one of the latter day physical improvements the Milwaukee Electric made in the 1930s, I believe, crossing the Milwaukee Road and the Menominee River, looking west, and off to the left is near the eventual site of County Stadium. And of course, there's not a trace of this visible anymore, but if you look deep into the distance of the picture, you start to pick up some of the rapid transit towers that are indeed still there uh, going past Soldier's Home. This is one that I don't know much about, but I did finally determine that this was a place, I first had thought this was in St. Louis, because I looked up the Papard Seed Company, and they operate in a couple of places in Missouri, and so does the Wabash, but uh, I finally determined that this is not St. Louis, it's downtown Kansas City, where the elevated local streetcar line crossed over the Wabash and probably a couple other railroads, probably in the vicinity of Kansas City Union Station. But talk about a, 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 a talk about a physical plant photograph. There's so much going on here: the bridge work, the freight depot, all the semi trailers, the cars, and that pedestrian walkway across the tracks. Very cool. Similarly, we have a great view at Massillon, Ohio, around 1950. Uh, where the Pennsylvania, Nickel Plate, and Baltimore and Ohio lines converge. Uh, moving off to your left, pointing toward the east, that's the Pensy main line with this westbound train coming off the bridge there. And in the foreground, I believe the uh, B&O is off to the right and the Nickel Plate in the middle, but I, I wouldn't swear to that. I don't remember my trackage well enough. Uh, but this is, a, this is a really interesting location. It still looks quite a bit like this today, including that wonderful curved through truss bridge on the Pensy. And you see the classic trademark cabin car on the end of the Pensy train. This is kind of a weird little photograph, but I wanted to include it. I, I wish Lynn took some other slides in Tampa, Florida, because really cool photographs of passenger railroading in Tampa are rare. Well, he didn't get a train, but he did get this rail testing vehicle working its way through the streets of Tampa, uh, lettered for the uh, Atlantic coastline. And of course, trains, Amtrak still goes down the street serving Tampa Union Station. Oh, that looks like an Edsel in the parking lot, doesn't it? Thanks to Ron Flannery for helping me out with this photograph, because this is another one that would really leave you scratching your head. Lynn didn't say a thing about where this was, and yet you can't show this picture to anybody without figuring out where it is, because that, that the whole meaning is wrapped up in the geography. We're looking from the place called The Pinnacle at Cumberland Gap, Tennessee in July 51. The Louisville and Nashville Depot is at the bottom of the photo. You can see there the uh, wooden frame station there. Uh, with LNN's Cumberland Valley Division approaching from the left. Southern Railway's line to Knoxville heads away toward the top. Both lines combine to use the tunnel near the bottom right to go under Cumberland Mountain. 
and I give Lynn credit for climbing a fair distance to get this photograph. It's not a drone picture, you us. <laughs> Who needs a drone? Uh, this is just an artful photograph that he got of semaphores at sunset in Marion, Ohio, junction of the Big Four, Chesapeake and Ohio and Erie. And I'm sure some of you have been to Marion before when their wonderful uh, interlocking tower perched atop some steel work, uh, a tower that Trains Magazine helped them move and restore with one of our preservation grants back in the 90s. Remember that? The semaphores aren't there anymore, but there's still a lot of signals in Marion. And now we're going to look at some stuff around Lynn's adopted hometown. And again, if I have anything here wrong, please shout out because this is territory you guys should know well. Although in some cases, Lynn actually did write down what, I was, what we were looking at. Thank you, Lynn. So here we are, one of Milwaukee Road's S Class 484s approaches Pilgrim Road in suburban Brookfield with an eastbound freight in 1946. Uh, doesn't look like that anymore. Well, it sort of does. I mean, it's still a very pretty attractive area, but, and I think off to the left might be where that big park is along North Avenue. Uh, I know there's a big park right near here. And Allison, this is right near that restaurant out there. Just this is just a stone's throw from Park, Park Side, nine twenty nine or whatever the heck it's called. And he's got a stack extension up there, uh, which was another tr trademark on some of the Milwaukee Road steam engines. So this is obviously you guys know this is east of uh, east of Brookfield Field where the main lines have split. Downtown, uh, we're at the. Uh, Milwaukee Road Station on on, on, uh, on Edison, uh, 462, ready to depart eastbound. Uh, and of course, we all know that this pretty much this very site is occupied now by the We Energy's Annex building. Uh, anybody who was transported from then to now wouldn't, they'd be baffled. <laughs> but you can see the uh, little bit of the AFF on the distance. That must have been the Pritzloff building, which is still there. And what I love about this picture is this is probably taken on a weekday afternoon when Westcott got off work, you know, and just wandered down from 1027 North 7th Street to see what was going on and took his camera with him. Of course, we could still do that today, but the photographs aren't nearly as cool. Another kind of same kind of shot, 1938 view from the corner of 6th and Clybourne. The afternoon Hiawatha is F7464 taking on water at the west end of the Milwaukee station. Uh, I think that's an interesting shot that Lynn shot it from such a distance. I think we're all familiar with lots and lots of photographs taken here by, you know, Scribbins and, and Al Kambach and a bunch of other people where they probably walked another 50 yards forward or more just to get more of the train scene in. But I I like to think that this was part and parcel of Lynn's fascination with the street, the, the, uh, the North Shore track. I believe that's a North Shore track in the foreground. Uh, might be TM, I'm not sure. And of course, the Milwaukee. Is it TM? Well, I know I know it was up, but somebody told me that the that there was a, a spur track that came off the North Shore, which is out of the picture to the left, for some weird city service that North Shore offered for a brief time. Uh, that's what I was told. Yeah. And because you look down on the lower left-hand corner, there's just a little piece of rail. And I almost wonder if that's the rail leading into the North Shore Station. But I, who knows? It's it, Or else now it's probably the curve that's going over there underneath the taxi cab. Yeah. Anyway, uh, there's not there's a couple things that still stand to this day. If you look closely enough, there's the uh, the old um, Wisconsin Bell building in the on the far left with its wedding cake top. And then, of course, the public service building is visible just to the left of the Milwaukee Road uh, clock tower. We're in the same vicinity. Uh, interesting that he got down for a rail view of a beaver tail observation car on the rear of the Chicago Twin Cities afternoon Hiawatha as it arrives in Milwaukee around 1938. Uh, love those uh, beaver tail cars. I, I know that 
the sky tops usually get the uh, the blue ribbon for being the coolest observation cars of all time. But uh, in its own funky kind of way, I think these beaver tails were maybe even cooler. Public service building on the right uh, with an interurban car uh, parked alongside it at the back. And in the distance, what we now know as the Milwaukee Hilton, but back then it was the Schrader. And you can see the cars ahead of the beaver tail curving around uh, on the curve there and entering the, uh, the train shed. Now we're in Tosa in an undated photo here. We need eastbound Milwaukee road train. I'm guessing a local train. Doesn't look like a very important train, but it's probably one of the local trains that ran. Pausing at the fabulous old Wauwatosa Depot. I don't know when this depot was torn down, but I know that sometime after World War II or maybe right during World War II, they replaced it with a very nondescript modern kind of boring brick building, which also was torn down later. And of course, now many of you will recognize that as the parking lot for some of the restaurants and stuff in the village. But this is what it looked like probably just before World War II. And there's a lot of interesting things going on here. Of course, the train itself is cool with that light Pacific on the passenger train and um, uh, one of the station employees going out with a snow shovel to clear the platform on the right. But also in the distance, you'll see the, uh, the building with the big billboard painted on the side of it. And uh, if it's possible that this was when Kambach's original or one of its original offices was on the second floor of that building. Which, which would make it uh, a situation in which Lynn simply got up from his desk and left for a while to photograph this train. Kambach was only in that building for a year or so. Then it moved to Pierce in an industrial building that still stands at the end of the 16th Street Viaduct. And then after that, they moved to 1027 North 7th Street. Now we're down on the lakefront. What a beautiful scene. Here's a Milwaukee, or a, excuse me, Northwestern E7 pulling off the 7.30 a.m. train from Chicago. In the distance, the Romanesque tower of Northwestern's much lamented lakefront station. And uh, this, this area is pretty recognizable, even though 80% of what's in this photograph is gone. But the Cudahy apartments still stand on the right. The beautiful slope, uh, somewhat landscaped slope of uh, Prospect Avenue coming down to the track still kind of looks like that. And even though it's a different bridge, the bridge across the tracks is in the same place. Of course, you can see the depot through the uh, arch of the uh, viaduct, and there's another train, a steam-powered train, waiting in the train shed in the distance. I don't know what the building was in the foreground. I assume it was related to the railroad, but I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. Here we're in the same station. I love the action in this picture as people station and train and have maybe passengers scurry around before the departure of a westbound train uh, from the lakefront train shed. I, I don't know what train it was. Uh, looks like a fairly serious train. Um, it, could it be an early iteration of the 400, <clears throat> Twin Cities 400? I don't know. But it could also be, uh, it could also be one of the trains up to the to Green Bay or somewhere north. But boy, I wish I wish I'd gotten to Milwaukee before this was torn down. Here we are uh, over in uh, the Summerfest parking lot, <laughs> if you will. Here we're at Northwestern's Lakefront Engine Terminal, uh, just off Erie and Chicago and those streets down in there. Uh, this is one of uh, Northwestern's 280s. It probably was used for local work. And the hostler up there is putting sand in the dome. And I just looked up this fact that Northwestern had 300 280s built between 1913 and 1923. Uh, but they had quite an engine terminal down there by Summerfest in those days. A big uh, big concrete coaling tower. I think it was concrete watering. And, and, a, and a roundhouse of uh, looked to be 20, 25 stalls maybe. I like this also because Lynn liked to get people pictures as we'll see as we continue. This is my favorite pair of photos, maybe in the whole presentation. Here we're standing on the um, 
TM line. Uh, I forgot who helped me identify where this, oh, Otto Dobnik helped me with the ID on this picture. We're looking east in West Dallas as a one of their giant Northwestern H8484s, Zeppelins. They were called, but Zeppelins, they surely were not. I'm quoting Morgan there. Uh, leading a westbound freight through West Dallas, heading for uh, heading for Butler at Belton. And then the distance is the 92nd Street Bridge over the tracks. Lots going on here, of course. You see the Northwestern's line to uh, Waukesha on the right, and on the left, uh, an original uh, TM electric line paralleling the Northwestern. And these engines were monsters. Well, here's another shot of the same train. He just simply turned around and looked the other way. So here the same train climbs up and over the uh, TM line to Waukesha before it turns to the north to head toward Butler. Great pair of shots. And again, not just a train picture, but a really good exposition of uh, a physical plant. And if you go to this spot today, you, you can kind of see what, you can see what everything here really might've looked like. Then finally, I'm going to wind up with some people shots that Lynn took, uh, which are really wonderful. Here's here's a shot of the uh, of a of a newsstand inside the late great concourse at Chicago Union Station in 1951, and you can see the corridor to the waiting rooms, which is now called the the Great Hall, which I never called the Great Hall. I think that's a lame name. To me, it's the waiting room. Capital W, capital R. Sorry. But Amtrak calls it the Great Hall. Uh, but where you're, where you're, what you're looking at now, of course, is where all of us who get Amtrak trains are all gathering like rabbits underneath this low ceiling, trying to struggle our way to whatever gate we have to get at. Uh, but uh, in those days, there was this huge vaulted ceiling, very reminiscent of Penn Station in Chicago, or in New York, excuse me, which makes a lot of sense because probably the main tenant of Union Station was indeed the Pennsylvania Railroad. But this, of course, was torn down in around 1965 or 66 to make way for the very pedestrian office building that now sits on Canal Street opposite the head house. Thank you for taking this picture, Lynn. <laughs> Here's a great shot of train crew shooting the bull with uh, a, a guy on the ground at Fergus Falls, Minnesota. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the same engine and the same crew that was in that earlier picture showing the caboose hop. But it's a great photograph of a ritual on the railroad as the crew looks through the train orders, the flimsies, and it's probably saying, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> and I don't, I can't decipher everything about this engine, but I can tell that it has 63 inch drivers because it says so on the cab. This is a, one of my favorite pictures. This is just a very, probably a lucky shot, but what a wonderful portrait of a railroad man doing his thing. This is a hostler attending to his charge on an 040T. The Illinois Central had just one or two or three of these. Roundhouse location unknown. Now, given the fact that Lynn lived in Milwaukee, <clears throat> this was probably Woodcrest, you know, or, or down there near... Uh, you know, down on the south side of Chicago, but I can't be, I can't be sure. It could also be 18th street on the lakefront of Chicago. I don't know, but the guy looks in my mind, heroic with a cigar in his mouth and his classic uniform standing in the gangway of this little bitty tiny engine. With huge numbers. With huge numbers. If you don't know this is 3286, then you need to get an eye exam. Another shot of a uh, crew exchanging comments about train orders or what some such. I have no idea where this was. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's Joliet or more maybe somewhere near LaSalle Street. I just don't know. Could be Kansas City, you know? He took some earlier pictures near Kansas City, but here we have the engineer of an E7 on the rocket conferring with another railroader. And I believe this is the last photograph in the presentation, but here's a Missouri Pacific yard clerk practicing his trade in Kansas City, uh, writing down train numbers, OSing a train perhaps, not sure, with that wonderful 
one bulb lamp hanging down from the ceiling. A railroader doing his thing. And thank you for that wonderful picture, Lynn. So Lynn lived 1913 to 1980, and I had to include this photo because, as as Keith knows and, and Mike knows, the, the MR staff has always been pretty jocular. They never took themselves very seriously. And uh, I, I don't know if a staff member made the sign or Lynn made it himself, but when I knew Lynn in 74, 75, and 70, early 76 before I quit in 76, I kind of always wondered where he always was, you know, because he was he was gone a lot. And of course, Lynn was an early stockholder for Combox. So he, by 1975, when I knew him, let's say, he he could pretty much write his own ticket. He could come and go as he pleased because he had uh, Russ Larson <laughs> to edit the magazine as managing editor and the rest of the staff. So uh, I remember many, many, many times walking down the fifth floor corridor past this open door and it was dark inside. Hence this wonderful dry humor sign. And of course, a quote I found from Morgan, Lynn, you were a teacher without a blackboard. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention tonight. Uh, I want to thank uh, several pictures, uh, people that have helped me with these pictures, uh, Abigail, Aaron, and Haley of the Center of Railroad Photography and Art staff, Brian Schmidt, my quote unquote boss at Classic Trains, helped me a lot, Rob McGonigal, my good friend, former editor of CTR, Tom Hoffman, who I think is watching tonight. Hello, Tom. Uh, Dave Lustig are out in Los Angeles. Ron Flannery, who helped me with that wonderful shot at Cumberland Gap. Steve Hawkins, he's the president of the Western Carolina Railway Service Corp. He helped me with the Piedmont Northern stuff. Otto, I mentioned Otto earlier. John Corns helped me with the Massillon shot. Uh, Chuck Weinstock, with, he, he was able to nail those PCC trolley cars in Pittsburgh. And Chuck Galetsky helped me with the 484, two 484 pictures in Michigan. And then finally, help, thanks to, for Mike for all his technical help with this whole thing and for inviting me to do this tonight. So thanks. And anybody, any questions you want to, uh, what else is on the program tonight? Something else? Or? You're the, uh, you're, hi, hi there. There, there, there. If, does anybody have any questions? If you do, come on up to the microphone. Otherwise, we'll open it up to the Zoom folks. Uh, any Zoom people? Uh, yes, uh, Mike. Uh, I just want to uh, congratulate. Uh, wonderful presentation. Wonderful stuff. And I enjoyed it immensely. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, I have a quick question. I'm from out of town. So I'm not familiar with the areas there. I think about the uh, third or fourth shot. You had this huge trestle. It was beautiful with this great train going over. Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but is that still in use? I believe it is. Uh, it's there. Uh, I can't remember the location now, but it's on the Northern Pacific in North Dakota. And, uh, you know, I just use a pretty, pretty basic way to check it out. Uh, I just went to Google Earth. And started satellite view and started following the NP main line until I got to the town that Lynn identified. And sure enough, the trestle's still there. It's in Valley City, North Dakota. The Sioux line goes underneath it. Very oh. good. Thank you. Thank you. I would have thought of that eventually, maybe, but <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thanks, Fred. Uh, that that tr the trestle that's going to be some somewhat northwest of uh, Fargo. Okay. Not not too far west of the uh, Minnesota state line. Very good. Thank you. Other questions? Any comments? Did I get make any mistakes on the Milwaukee locations? I, I anybody catch anything there? Yeah, that's good. Good. Well, thanks everybody. Appreciate it. I'll hand it over to Mike. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and I'd also like to say uh, thanks to the people who uh, are in the room here that 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 help make this uh, thing work properly. Give it up for Sal Schiafani here. Sal, uh, one of our tech gurus, and also Keith Schmidt, our vice president uh, for the tech tech help tonight. Um, Dan and Tara helped uh, uh, set us up.
tonight as well. It takes a village, you know, and 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 uh, we wouldn't be able to do it without the help of you guys. So with that, uh, we will close the meeting, remind you that next week, next month, sorry, not next week, next month, um, Jim Rint will be doing his presentation on the um, interurban and streetcar railways of Sheboygan County, which um, again, Jim is the leading historian of Sheboygan County Railways, and it's going to be a a, a a wonderful a wonderful presentation. I just I just know it, and if not, he's going to give you your money back. Um, and then we're making a plan for uh, February, and then uh, uh, March, our March meeting will uh, have a, a look back from Tom Hoffman. So. Um, so thank you to all of the members who make our programs possible. And uh, if you're not yet a member of the Wisconsin chapter NRHS, please become a member, www.nrhswis.org. And um, we, will, uh, we will wish you all a very, very happy holiday season.